and I'm just getting the live stream ready and then we can go. All right. Oh, nice. I think your message might have been just to panelists. Oh, okay. Oh, well. Um, but you can change it right above the, the chat window where you type. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a drop down and you can send it to all panelists and attendees. All right. Great. Mm. Awesome. All right. Let's. Um, well, we'll kick off. So welcome everyone uh, to another episode of Data Futurology. Um, Data Futurology, we, we want to cover um, all the relevant aspects in um, machine learning, in AI, in data science. And uh, today we're gonna to be focusing on, on the programming side and obviously a hugely popular um, uh, programming language in data science is Python. And in, in data science, there's so many parts uh, that, or there's so many skills that we can learn from, from Python development and software engineering in Python, uh, skills that can really help us improve our, our data science skills, our, our coding skills, and the way that we solve problems. So today we're gonna be focusing on, uh, from, from, a software engineering, from a software engineering perspective, what are really great um, Python skills, programming skills, um, how how do you uh, design architectures for your for your programs from a top down perspective, and uh, be able to create large projects that are quite cohesive and something? It's a skill that um, we I, I think that everyone uh, can benefit from. So welcome, uh, thanks so to the people that are uh, live with us, and um, for everyone listening in on the on the podcast or um, following the episodes and watching the, um, the series on YouTube. Um, welcome and thank you. Thank you for, for joining and being here. So today we have Doug Farrell and he is uh, the author of a, a book called The Well-Grounded Python Developer. Uh, Doug has about 35 years of experience in software engineering. Um, he's You'll see, he's basically done it all um, from, from embedded systems to rich applications uh, on the web, um, retail systems, etc. cetera. Uh, so the, anyway, breadth of experience. I wanna welcome Doug. Doug, how are you doing today? Thank you very much, Philippe. It's great to be here. Welcome everybody. I'm doing fine. It's, been, it's a beautiful day here in Connecticut. Right. Thank you so much for making the time. And I should say, as as usual, we will be taking uh, questions from the audience um, that are live. So we have a, a Q and A section uh, that um, that you can access. You can put your questions there as we go through the um, as we go through the episode, and uh, you can also upvote other people's questions. So if you see another question that you like, give it a thumbs up and that'll go up towards the top um, and we'll start with the questions that are most highly uh, voted. So Doug, uh, to kick things off, I wanted to ask you if you can give us uh, a little bit of, of your background, a little bit of your journey. Um, tell us about your pre-software engineering days uh, and and then how you got started in the field. Well, I was... Um... I got started developing quite late. I was 28 by the time I hit it, but before that, I was uh, doing a lot of different things as you would. I was uh, out of college because I hadn't figured out why I was there. So I was out of college for a while. And uh, through friends, I got a job at this uh, a bronze sculpture foundry that's quite well known in the world, uh, making large, highly accurate uh, reproductions of um, original artist's work in bronze, which was a lot of fun, um, very interesting people to work with, very interesting clients, uh, artists from all over the world coming over to make statues that would be as small as a few inches up to, I think the biggest one I worked on was 25 feet tall. Wow. And, uh, many, many tons of, of bronze. Uh, and I did that for five years. I became the foreman of the mold room. That, that's the part of the job that takes the, uh, the mold off the artist's original piece, which can be clay or plaster or who knows what. Um, and that, that's how you get the original reverse negative impression of the, of the art 
which you start, that's how you start making a lost wax casting, which is what we did. And uh, that was, that was interesting, a lot of fun. But um, after a few years, I'm, I'm a pretty big guy, but after a few years, I realized that the physicality of that work was not sustainable for a career but that it was that would grind me down. And plus um, I had more interest, interest in stuff in um, uh, my dad was actually the one who got into computing with the Radio Shack, one of those like uh, ruler sized computers with the single bar LCD screen. Nice. Uh, it was great. And it sort of got me turned on a little bit. I went back to school and uh, uh, by that time, in the middle of school, I got married, and so I was in a position where I really needed to get working. So mm-hmm. I, I had um, it was kind of a it was a funny thing. I had gone in thinking I was going to dual major in art and uh, engineering, and the admissions officer said, "You're out of your mind. There's no way you could handle that workload." So I went outside and flipped a coin, and it came down on 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 engineering, which I I followed through physics. At that school, they had a, pr- a pre-program in physics, which would eventually lead to uh, engineering at UConn. Uh, but I needed to get to work. So I've com- in three years, I completed my physics degree. And uh, my senior project was building a very primitive CAT scanner with the uh, department head using uh, Pascal and uh, high precision at the time, rotation and translation engines. Uh, and then I, after that, I bought my first uh, color, my first Radio Shack color computer, and never turned back. <laughs> That's crazy. That is amazing, man. And um, so, do you, where where did the the passion for for programming um, initially come from, and how did it develop? Was it was it from from your dad kind of like showing you that that um, that computer, which would have been, I reckon, in the late seventies, maybe eighties. Oh, yeah. um, was it was it sort of that that uh, sparked your mind, or or uh, do you think that there was other other attributes or other time periods in your life that, that brought you oh, to yeah. a kind of passion there? Definitely, because I had taken classes the first time I was in college. I had taken programming classes in Fortran uh, with punch cards, and I yep. was totally turned off, completely turned off. And it, but it, and it wasn't until um, personal mini com- microcomputers became available that I really got turned on that that senior project was one thing, but being able to uh, you know buy a computer and of course like a lot of kids at the time I was thinking I was going to be able to write games really cool games on that thing, but the idea of being able to create stuff uh, through just the sort of the will of my mind in order to create something that actually does something, you know, does video on the screen, reacts to my input uh, through the joystick and keyboard. That was amazing to me. That was very amazing to me. And uh, it helped me. I learned a little, I thought on that computer, I learned some basic, of course, and then I learned a little 6809 uh, assembler. And that gave me enough buzzwords to get my first engineering job as a process control engineer. That's um, okay, great, because that's that's what I wanted to ask you about. If you give us a, an overview of your of your career to date, and um, yeah. and yeah, what are some of the key milestones? And then yeah, I'm definitely keen to ask you about like where you got your embedded systems experience, which it sounds like it was right at the beginning, and then uh, and then how yes. you have progressed from there. Well, I, I took this job as a process control engineer, which is. Um, uh, is a, at, at a manufacturer that uh, they also had a, a systems house, which is they, they manufacture sensors, industrial grade sensors for uh, temperature, mm-hmm. tank levels, flow rates. And they, they were big in gas pipeline and um, water treatment plants. And that was what I did. I was a process control engineer for them. They also manufactured their own line of uh, specialized computers to do process control. And uh, the big their big idea was that they had a, created us a, a, a language that uh, essentially turned what physical process control with comparators, uh, PID controllers, timers, counters, uh, relays, things like that. They had taken that idea and turned it into software. And so this computer that they made would interface with their own equipment uh, and sensors and everybody else's equipment and be able to control things like uh, water treatment plants, gas pipelines, wastewater treatment. And I spent, I don't know, four years uh, doing process, doing building systems like that to control um, clean water systems and gas pipelines. And we did a lot of what's called distributed control, where you have 
these computers were all over the plant and gathering data, controlling things and talking uh, back to a larger central system, which is called a SCADA system. Uh, at that time, for us, it was a, a digital VAX computer. Uh, and it would that's, gather that's data. The original, that's the original IoT, right? That's, oh, how, yeah, that's, very that's much. IoT except before was, IoT. Except it was as big as a refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the size of a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> You know, I, I showed an aptitude for that, and we had a, a small SCADA system that was built on uh, a version of CPM, a concurrent version of CPM that was running Pascal, and I programmed a lot on that and showed an aptitude, and eventually I moved to uh, the software development group um, that was running the big, you know, writing so software for the big uh, SCADA system, and that was where I got exposed to a lot of very smart guys there, mostly masters and PhDs in computer science. And uh, I learned a lot of C. That's, it was all C and Fortran. Eventually, it was all C. In fact, my entire career was based on the idea that I was trying to uh, come up with a problem, you know, like work on something to try to solve it. And then if I couldn't solve it, go to my boss. And my goal was if it took longer than 15 seconds for him to solve it, that was a win. <laughs> but I never did. He always had it in <laughs> <the> moments. <laughs> I, think, I think that's a good, really good approach. Um, in general, though, to try and uh, and that, that's something that I always encourage um, my teams to do to uh, find find a problem, um, try to solve it, or come up with alternatives, try to solve it, and um, and if if they can't, then go and go and get yeah. get help because then you've already done the the thinking, the groundwork, and then once yeah. you get a more experienced person to talk through a an approach and an answer with you, you can. Um, you can notice the differences in thinking, uh, the difference in the decision making, and you can you can um, refine your own your own thinking. So it sounds like you had that from from the start, basically. Absolutely, absolutely. It also it it influenced the way I mentor and teach um, mm -hmm. that process because quite often when I if I help someone, someone comes to me with a question. Very often, um, I find if I just if I just listen very closely. And not interject and try to take over. I don't want to solve, you know, I try very hard not to solve the problem for them. Mm. So what happens is the act of explaining it to me to try to get me into the context of the problem, they solve it themselves. Yeah. The, the problem reveals itself by the act of having to put it together into words. The, that's, um, that's a very gratifying moment. Man, the, uh, the rubber ducky approach of... Um, yes. Exactly. Yeah, have have a, a rubber ducky next to your computer, and when you have a problem, try to explain it to the rubber ducky as if it was somebody else, that, and it will definitely help. Um, and what do you think of the of the the opposite of that case? So cases where people find come across a problem and they are able to solve it. It might be a new problem for them, and they're solving it for the first time. Um, that's an area that often, at least in my experience, it often doesn't get any airtime after the fact. Um, sometimes it's not not very well reviewed because it's something that's seen as as solved. Um, have you have you um, just just out of curiosity, basically? Have, um, do you have any any approaches since since you, have, you you teach you mentor and you you um, you know have developed so many other developers? Um, is that do you do something like um, I don't know like a code review or um, oh, yeah. things things like that that can help people improve even when they have achieved the the goal? Yeah, I've, there's two things that I do. I mean, I, I like doing code reviews for people, especially if I do it one-on-one -on -one where I get to really, really read the code. I mean, I've done lots of cursory code reviews just to make sure it works. That's, I'm not so sure how valuable that is. For the, it's not so valuable for the developer. But if I can do an in-depth code review, I, I had a job, my embedded systems job, where I was, I was essentially the repository gatekeeper. And I read everything. I read everything that got checked in. And um, I would take opportunities to say, you know, could we, could we improve this? Do you see a pattern here that we could repeat and, re you know, use it over or reduce the amount of code you're generating? Um, and hopefully, you know, those, those were, were received well. Um, yeah. That's the, like being the, the editor of a, of a magazine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
it's harder now because the pace of the pace of stuff that gets generated is so fast. It's very difficult to read everything. Mm. Um, but if people, um, you know, people I work with, and they, they'll ask me specifically, could you take a look at this? And uh, one of the things I learned from a, a manager that I worked for, who was very sharp, was, um, you know, when you're managing, uh, oftentimes you can't, you don't get to code projects yourself. Uh, and one of the things that he taught me was that when people would solve things, you know, their own solutions, the engineers that worked for him, he, he would look at it and say, yeah, that works. It's not how I would do it, but I have to let it go because it, it does, it meets the requirements. And maybe it's not how I would do it, but that's okay. And Isn't that's that so true? I do too. Oh, man. And it's, it's, um, it's difficult to make that transition to... Um, Very hard. Yeah, to to um, yeah to to delegate to that to that degree um, as a as a manager, it definitely helps you expand your um, your circle of influence and the impact that you can have the, by by providing direction and and guidelines essentially. But um, definitely, like you you hand over so many of the decisions that you've been used to making, you hand over to other people and then, yeah, you have to, you have to um, step back. <laughs> I, I was a manager for a year at um, one of my jobs. I, you know, I was a senior engineer and, and uh, became manager of the group. And um, I, it was a mixed bag. I, 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 res I resisted not, not coding. Like I tried to do some projects, but what ended up happening was I would give all the interesting work to my team and I would keep all this crummy crappy jobs for myself yeah. and I you know because I had limited time to focus on it and uh at the, you know after the after I decided to go back into programming it was because um I consider myself an okay manager a, wa a good walking around manager because I I work with my team directly I mentor directly we have a lot of conversations I try to help them um grow professionally I try to protect protect them professionally from demands from above. But as I think my manager probably thought I was a terrible manager because I could care less about the budget and I hated long meetings and I was in a lot of meetings and you know, was, I really didn't, I, the scheduling thing I found ridiculous because we were doing a waterfall. So um, every two minutes, the whole waterfall would change because yeah. priorities would change. <laughs> so, and, and after I did that for a year and I decided to, I had an opportunity to um, go work for a, pl a place where I could be a Python developer full time. And I took it and never regretted it. <laughs> yeah. I'm a technologist, uh, you know, but man, I, um, I, I admire the, the self-awareness um, and how uh, you are prioritizing um, happiness and satisfaction in, in your yeah. work, uh, which meant sort of leaning into your, your strengths and 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 continue to develop them them. Um, so yeah, I, I generally um, in general I think that leaning into into your strengths uh, or or for people to lean into their strengths is um, often a, has a higher payoff than than trying to fix weaknesses. <laughs> um, and and yeah, and and I think uh, that plus plus happiness and satisfaction uh, definitely. Definitely sounds like the right decision. Um, for me, it was. For me, it was. I had, you know, after a year, I felt like the skills that I'd spent a lifetime honing were starting to slip. Yeah, and I didn't like that at all. Yeah, yeah. I and um, was it? Over, uh, even though in hindsight you're very happy about the decision, was it a hard decision to take at the time? No. <laughs> Actually, right for me for me it wasn't it was a it was uh it was a hard place to work anyway mm -hmm. and so i have I, I tell this to people all the time i have three things that i that i gauge my job on and that's the company the work and the people i work with nice uh, and if two two of those things are working which usually is the work and the people i work with mm -hmm. i'm happy i can yeah. i'll stay but if it starts to dip below that i'm out of there and uh the I, you know the company was problematic uh, for me, and but the people were great, but my work was not satisfying. So that started to drop below my threshold. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And that was um, 14, 15 years ago that you made yeah. that transition back to full-time development, right? Yep, yep. 
yeah, that's that's great. And then um, so that that's been full time in Python. And what what type of things have you been working on? Well, we had uh, I got hired by um, my publisher, which was later acquired by Shutterfly, mm -hmm. and. Um, for me, it covered a nice kind of a sweet spot because I worked in the manufacturing side, the production side of the business. So all the software that we were writing was all about um, actually producing something and interfacing with machinery, mm -hmm. uh, which kind of is hits the sweet spot for me for kind of embedded systems where the software is affecting the real world, yes, um, which is a lot of fun. And uh, plus, I had the stuff I was doing had immediate effect on. Uh, my customers, and in my case, my customers were the production people, uh, that I could make their yeah. jobs easier. I could make the you know stuff work faster. That you know they have all have quotas and things like that that you're on the hit. So I could get things to work smoother. I wrote a lot of uh, tools for our financial uh, people for reporting, so they could see they could see into the plant in sort of real time uh, nice. where things were. You know what the money flow was, where the, where orders were in the plant, uh, how things were progressing. And then, you know, we just wrote a lot of stuff to get uh, orders processed, get our customer, our real customers uh, who are bu buying photo products, get that process in what we call imposed and press ready, you know, getting it onto a press, off a press, into the next machine, cutting, binding, weight, uh, packaging, shipping. Uh, all those processes uh, are run by pieces of software that get, get things in the right place in the right format in order to manufacture them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then and then how was the how was the change from um, being able to oh, write writing software to be able to change the the physical world to moving to I guess more more of a digital presence and um, interacting with with people instead of machines or having the software interact with people instead of machines. Well, I, I really like that. I I like I had written ages ago. I had written some Windows GUI programs, which is very very hard back in yeah. the day. Very hard. Uh, but I, I adopted at, at uh, my publisher and then Shutterfly, I adopted um, this full stack te technology where I would, it was a small team. So I would develop the back end system and a front end system at the same time, which it, early on it was uh, jQuery with a lot of jQuery plugins. Oh, yeah. Web applications uh, mm -hmm. that would talk, talk through REST calls to the back end for data and uh, interact with the system that way. Uh, the um, using jQuery with Ajax at the time was very useful because it was for the production facility. It was very much faster to have data going back and forth. The, the way the production works everywhere is uh, you know you have a barcode scanner and there's something that's coming out with a barcode on it that you scan and that that tells the system where is that thing right now and what are, where is it going next and. Uh, that kind of scan would happen very quickly with Ajax and update the database and kick off a workflow to mm -hmm. move this order to the next step of the process. And, and then recently I've been moving more towards um, uh, Angular web apps, which I really like. You know, and, and building front, front end applications is very challenging because users are tricky. Yeah. <laughs> they can be very tricky and they, do, they discover things that you just never anticipated how they would use the app. Uh, mm -hmm. And then trying to, you know, just simple things like picking drop down lists and pre populating the next one and the next one. You know, those are very useful to make, and they're just below the surface, but they're very useful to the actual user experience about how, mm. you, how a user perceives the work and whether it's effective or not. It's true. Yeah. And the, the yeah, whether it's effective or not. And then the, by, by, Focusing on the on on those details, um, it significantly reduces the friction into how the the customer can get value from the interaction with the with the application. So yeah, it definitely makes a a world a world of difference. And tell me how how did that work lead onto your book, and 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 and, well, and tell us a little bit about the book. Well, I, I um, as you can tell, I'm fairly talkative, um, and I. I had been doing a little bit of uh, fiction writing and I was starting to doing some writing and I was improving my writing a lot because uh, one of the things that everybody, sh everybody should think about is that it's, as a software engineer, a very important skill is to bring up your writing ability. It's super important. Um, and so I started writing a lot of documentation that was well received and uh, 
And then I was doing at Shutterfly, they have, um, they have all hands engineering meetings twice a year. And um, we would, everybody would get together and they'd do, they would do, they would have presentations that people would do as well as talk about the roadmap of what's coming. And I started giving presentations that were well received and, and uh, people asked me like, are you gonna give up, you know, could you do one for the next all hands? So I would put these presentations together and that requires a lot of writing um, oh. for the for the slide deck. I would do I would do some interesting slide decks with uh, uh, actually build web applications as my slide deck rather than using PowerPoint because I'm not a big fan of PowerPoint. Nice. Um, and I also I also went to uh, what, they, what they call a, a, a group called Toastmasters, which is a public speaking group uh, to improve my presentation. Uh, I usually don't have too much trouble talking, but you know, they had a lot of good points about how to improve your uh, verbal communication skills. And that all sort of led to starting to write for um, Dan Bader, who's the founder. He's, he owns uh, realpython.com. And kind of, I took some of the presentations that I had put, in together, put together for work and wrote articles around them. Uh, and then when he bought um, Real Python, I just I kept going and started writing articles that were that were popular on realpython.com. I've got like, like six or seven articles published there. Uh, I had a series that was very popular on REST APIs and then how to move that from what a REST API was and then how to make it persistent in a database. And then finally I put together a, an entire app where you had a, a, a simple web app that accessed uh, that API that you just built. And then the, uh, the Manning, um, one of the acquisition editors at Manning had been reading my articles and reached out to me and uh, we got to talking about the book, a book, and what that would be like and the kind of book I thought would be useful. And, you know, we went back and forth, wrote a couple of table of contents overviews and uh, now I'm on the hook for a book. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And uh, man, I gotta say, I'm, I'm also a huge fan of Toastmasters. Hey, like, um, yeah. Yeah, I did it for some time, and yeah, I I also found it super helpful in in improving uh, my communication, the the yep. structure uh, of of yeah when when speaking, when communicating, uh, um, developing so many so many skills that um, you often don't realize how um, how pervasive they are in the in their need and and what a oh, difference they can make. And I, I, you know, I'm not going to name any names, but I've been to a lot of these all hands where somebody is up there and they're just reading the slide deck. They got their head down and they're reading the text of the slide deck. I'm like, oh my God, this is death. Yeah, literally, literally death. Um, yeah. And tell me, how's, how's the process been of writing a book? So obviously it's a huge, huge task. Um, yeah. Often people find it, you know, not only very daunting but but uh quite quite lonely work it's um long and tedious and it takes you away from you know from from your family from your other um commitments and in the case of writing a a, a book with code you've got a uh, parallel streams of the oh, the yeah. writing of the text and the writing of the code um how have you found the process so far how's it all how's it all been well, uh, you could sort of sum it all up with one word. It's horrendous. No, it's uh, it's, <laughs> it's been it's been very interesting. It's very interesting. I, mean, I have a very busy work life. I have a very very busy family life. Uh, so adding uh, the book onto that meant a couple of things had to change. I have I have quite a few hobbies that I pursue. I was trying to teach myself how to play. That I have some hobbies that I pursue that I'm trying to exercise the other side of my brain. Mm -hmm. like I'm trying to teach myself how to play the ukulele. Nice. Um, I, I have a I have a two year degree in commercial art, and I started getting back into painting after many years, and uh, but all that had to get put on hold with the book yeah. because there's you know with the job and my family, every other spare minute is uh, has to focus on the book in order for it to progress in some meaningful mm -hmm. way. And I yeah. want to hit, I want to hit a target window. You know, I, just, what I'm writing, I want it to be relevant by the time I'm done. Exactly. Exactly. Which is always. Um, a challenge like it's quite tough um with software books because the uh, yeah the pace the pace of change is is oh, huge yeah. um and tell me how um how did you structure the book what what are what are people going to go through and what are they going to get out of the out of reading the book and well, who, who is it who is it um targeted to sorry as well 
Well, we, we talked about that with uh, Manning quite a bit, my targeted reader. And um, for me, um, I didn't really want to write a beginner's book in Python because there's lots of great ones. And, you know, that's, that's not what I want to do. And there's lots of, um, there's quite a few Python books that are kind of expert level books that focus on a particular thing, uh, mm -hmm. data mining with Python or AW, you know, uh, microservices with Python or black hat hacking with Python. Those are all very, those are great books, but they all are kind of narrowed focused and you have to be a pretty developed, far along developer to really make use of them. And then there's the cookbook, the Python cookbooks, um, which I also like a lot. Um, but again, you have to be a pretty good developer already to adapt those recipes from the cookbook to something that's relevant to you. So my goal is, uh, and when I teach, when I teach at the STEM school, um, my goal for the book and what I saw as my reader was someone who knows Python, they're, they're past a beginner, they can write, you know, maybe a single file Python program that does something useful, uh, utility programs, maybe a single, uh, a single file web app, a simple web application. Uh, but I want to help that person progress. To, now they have a, a fully stocked tool belt, but now how do they use that to build a, a house? Mm -hmm. uh, how do I go forward from just a bunch of disconnected tools to, oh, I see these tools as building an integrated thing. This is how I put, this is why I loop over something. This is why mm -hmm. I'm making conditional statements about creating a larger application and being able to see uh, the big picture of where you want to go and that they would have the ability, hopefully at the end of the book, to do that kind of work. And so the book has really two, two parts. I have a lot of introductory stuff about things that I think are important to beginning developers, like um, mm -hmm. namespaces, um, uh, why you'd want to use virtual environments in Python, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, namespaces, classes, class design, um, the separation of, of responsibilities, things like that that are just useful. And those are all kind of standalone chapters. But the goal is to start that those things build towards where I am now in the book, which is uh, building your own blogging platform. Now, it's not that exciting. There's lots of blogging platforms you can just pull off the shelf. They're, they're great. But that's not the point. Mm -hmm. uh, a blogging application, you know, this application is fairly involved and it has a, it has a lot of moving parts those namespaces are gonna come into that, like separating authentication from content, mm -hmm. from administration. Uh, there's gonna be a database in there. We gotta know how to talk to a database. We've got to know how to build uh, a web application and how do we get data in and out, you know, through forms and then uh, through um, uh, WT forms, how do you populate, populate the presentation? And then I also, I'm trying to make the, the application look good. So I'm using, I'm using Bootstrap. Uh, and doing a little bit of education about, you know, don't try to style it yourself. Just, you know, use Bootstrap. My book is not about design. It's about Python. So use this tool to make the thing look good because that matters. And, you know, make it responsive for smaller devices, all those things that are that come with something like Bootstrap. And that's great because um, in, in um, for me and in my, in my jobs, um, at least in the last three, in the last four jobs, actually, um, even though I've been leading uh, data analytics and data science teams, we have built external reporting platforms that are web applications uh, that our, our customers use every day to get, in, to get uh, reports, insights, dashboards, analysis, um, as well as the predictions coming out of the models. And all the components that, that you just mentioned are um, that you just mentioned when talking about that the blogging uh, creating a blogging platform they are all extremely relevant and, and just as useful in creating a, a web application for, for as an external reporting platform so it's um, yeah super and, and yeah we've had yeah we've, we've had to cross a few of those bridges like separating the authentication from the content um, what does that look like? separating the, you know, the, the web application layer from the API, uh, from the back end, and how do we ensure things like security so we don't get SQL yes. injection, um, <laughs> things like that. Um, and really, really good. We got a question from, from Jason. Uh, he says, so would you need to be an intermediate level Python programmer to get value out of your book? What do you think, Doug? 
Well, it, it depends on where you are. I, I, when I talk to Manning about, you know, who's my, probably my, my reader, my reader um, you know, beginning programmers is sort of the big target. But the other part is, the other target that I think of is, um, and this might cover the person who asked the question, um, people who are, who are developers, but they're coming from another language, uh, you know, like Java or Node or, you know, PHP, uh -huh. something like that. Uh -huh. And um, they know the basics of programming and they could figure out the syntax of Python pretty quickly. But how, again, so they might jump into the middle, like how do I put these things together? How do I build something I know how to build, but do it with Python? Yeah, yeah. And I, don't, um... I don't think, I, I think that the, that there is value for an intermediate developer. It depends on the kind, you know, how far along they are. Um, you know, I've, I'm sure you've had the same experience. I've bought lots of computer books in my life that only a third of them have been actually useful to me. A third of the content has been useful. And that might be the case if, depending on how far along uh, this user is. Yeah, well, I like your analogy of uh, people having having a tool belt um, and and being able to do maybe, yeah, a standalone application, maybe kind of like a little bit of handiwork here and there, basically, but then um, the your book takes them to being able to to build a house um, with all the, the components, the constituent components. So that's that's really that's really good. Um, and so I, yeah, I really like that you focus on building web applications um, because yeah of the, the tremendous use that, that I've seen it in, in the analytics space of, of building web applications. Um, for yeah, as as I mentioned, like at least in my in my last four jobs, in order to get insights to to customers, um, and I noticed that through the book you have uh, multiple versions of web applications that are being built over the book. Um, tell tell me about what you got planned for uh, for the, the different iterations of it. Well, it's it's sort of it's progressing. Uh, um, chapter seven really started the. Uh, the first iteration of what I call the my blog application. And it was just presenting mostly how to build a simple flash application with some interaction. Mm -hmm. It has, it has one page with a button that uh, interacts with the banner. And um, it, it, I showed how to do like a very primitive page count, page views counter, things like that. And it showed those, that kind of thing shows like, okay, there's data flowing back and forth between the app and the user at this point. And where the dividing line is between the client and the and the server, mm -hmm. um, but it's all at, at that level it was all um, almost straight Flask in one application in one file with uh, hand coded CSS, mm -hmm. and then the progress it progresses from there, like um, in chapter eight, which just turned into a giant chapter. <laughs> it moves into that's where I take that basic app with the hand coded CSS and turn turn it into a bootstrap app. So it does the same functionality, but now it, all, it uses all bootstrap and how that ties into the system and how you how you do that and why. I talk about the, you know, the advantages of bootstrap with responsive design, consistent styling. Uh, you know, it's a lot of work to write uh, complex CSS, I've done it. Um, and then uh, we, we moved past that, like adding um, external configuration files to the application so that uh, any private or secret information can be take, taken out of the code and kept in a, in a separate file so that it, it keeps that private information private. And then using that configuration to add um, the Flask debug toolbar, which is a useful development tool, but then make it only appear when the app is running in development mode, uh, not in production. Uh, and then logging, uh, adding logging, which can be very handy. And then the distinction like keeping a debug level log at the development level and an info level log at the uh, yes. production level. And then the next step is um, I'm gonna do authentication with, mm. um, with Flask login and how that works. And then the chapter after that, because it's just gonna be, a, um, there's no backend persistence for the, uh, for the users in, this, mm -hmm. in that version. It's strictly an in-memory thing. Uh, and then the next step is gonna be talking about, it's gonna take a little side trip into database design uh, and how to use that with SQL Alchemy uh, in Python and Flask. And then we'll come back to finishing up authentication and creating users and, you know, forgot, forgot my password pages and things like that. Uh, and then we'll dive into uh, actually creating the blog. <laughs> yeah. 
Man, I love it. I love it. Super, super relevant. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the the importance of thinking big picture. So one and 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 how how you got to to that point of of thinking big big picture and 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 teaching big picture thinking, mentoring that. Um, why? Tell me about the the yeah, the importance of thinking big picture for for software developers and what that means. Well, I- for me, a lot of it was uh, uh, self-preservation. Yeah. <laughs> trying to, if you try to think about you know, some a, a project like Excel, uh, writing writing a program like Excel, that's a huge domain space. That's a gigantic technical domain space, um, and it's it's impossible, even with really smart people, it's impossible to keep all of that information in your head. So, mm-hmm. for me, the big picture is um, okay. This is my goal. This isn't this isn't new stuff. Is to break a big problem down, like uh, an application where you want to go, into smaller uh, problems. And I think of it as domain spaces, where I, I tend to break things up along what to me seems like logical logical lines. Like so, for like my application, authentication authorization is a problem that I can put into this namespace, uh, where I can keep this and. Uh, only think about that. I don't have to think about how the pages get rendered. I don't have to think about, you know, the security that it provides. I don't have to think about the blog. It's just this little piece just does that one thing. And uh, it minimize, it shrinks the, yeah. um, the amount of things I have to keep in my head at one time. Uh, and it also, it prevents spaghetti. It helps prevent spaghetti code. I mean, that's very easy to uh, have things where they get, things get too mixed up where you have, Okay, this is I'm doing this here, and now now I'm suddenly, you know, one of the things with web applications. I'm sure you're aware of this is I don't do any I/O until the very last moment. Mm-hmm. Everything is passing data around until you actually want to present it. Yeah, and it's very easy as a as a beginning programmer to do print statements or out I/O. Yeah, uh, really low down, and now all of a sudden that functionality is no longer useful because you're it's doing I/O work, and all I wanted was the data. And it's that kind of that that way of thinking for me. I, when I teach um, my students at the STEM place, um, one of the things I try to emphasize to them is, you know, programming is a big topic. I've been at it for a long time, and I still I don't know everything by far. Um, so to keep their interest, you know, sometimes the kids will come in with a 500 page reference book on something, and like that's not going to help you. You know, that's it's a boat anchor. Uh, so they're like, well, how should I learn this? I mean, I, I want to learn how to program Python, and they're going to read this whole book, and they think they know how to do it. I'm like, no, 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 no. Pick, pick, pick an idea, pick a program that you want to develop, something that interests you, like I don't know, tracking your your uh, snowboarding adventures, or uh, keeping track of uh, your D and D games, or who knows what, something that interests you, mm-hmm. and that will do two things. It will keep you fired up to keep moving forward because learning how to program is demanding work and can be boring. There's a lot of details there. But by picking something that's of interest to you, that'll keep you fired up. And, we'll, and the other thing it does is it narrows the focus of what you have to learn in order to create that thing. So you just learn what you need to do that. And I love that philosophy. That is that is outstanding. And um, I I think... Um, I just I just realized the the time and I'm gonna be I'm gonna be respectful of your time. I think that is a, a fantastic note to end on. I definitely wanted to ask about yeah your your passion and your approach to to teaching and and uh, yeah I'm so glad that that nat- naturally came out in the conversation. It's it's um, something that I see you being so passionate about and something that you you know obviously bring to your to your work outside of work and now the book. Um, it's a fantastic approach and. Doug, I want to thank you so much for your time uh, and thank you for thank writing you the book. Much. Thank you for caring and giving back. Um, yeah, can't, can't wait to um, to read the rest of it. I'll be sure to let you know when it's actually available and it's finished. Perfect. And we'll include uh, a link in the show notes. Um, thanks for everyone uh, who joined. Thanks for everyone who's um, watching uh, the video on YouTube afterwards, uh, listening to the podcast. Uh, there are obviously much, many more episodes there uh, for you to enjoy. Let me know if you have any feedback on this episode or any of the other ones. Doug, thank you again. And uh, for everyone listening, uh, take care and have a great day. See you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.